Hello, my name is Kirill Turkashen. And I'm Chilling Swester. Today we're going to talk about static analysis and JavaScript and tools that use it. JavaScript is a dynamic language and it's really hard to analyze because of that. And when I say, say dynamic, I don't only really mean dynamic, the dynamic typization, when you don't know what kind of variable will come as an argument to a function. I also mean it's weakly type language. Even if you infer it, you still cannot be sure you won't be subtracting array from an object at some point. It also prototype, prototype inheritance doesn't help. Uh, if you modify just one object in a prototype chain, the whole prototype chain can be changed. And because of this, there is a common misconception that uh, there are no great tools for JavaScript and they cannot be as powerful as tools for statically type languages like Java. But actually we're going to try to prove today that it's a myth and that's not how it is. So we'll start with overview of a couple of tools which use static analysis. It will be uh, code style, linting, co code metrics, and visualization. And we'll talk about how we can detect duplicated code. And then we'll move to more interesting part, how we can use dynamic analysis to help uh, static analysis to do great things and improve your, our workflow. And let's start about how static analysis works. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, so the reason there's two of us is because we thought there were two screens and we should maximize the resource utilization. And the reason I'm talking into a microphone is it would be very awkward to talk into his mouthpiece, right? So, uh, so let's see what static analysis is. So static analysis, by the very definition of the word static, means you're trying to gather some metrics on your code without actually executing it. So how do you usually do static analysis? So the first thing you want to go is you want to come up with a, with a, with a re representation of your code that is amenable to mechanic, uh, uh, being able to uh, being analyzed mechanically. So we usually build an abstract syntax tree. And once you have it, that is the mechanically amenable form for analysis, and you analyze it. And most of the times, that's what you're interested in, you're happy with it. But if you want to do something more, if you're adventurous, you could transform the AST. And then from the transformed AST, you could regenerate the code. And you would do these last two steps to do things like minification, optimization, uglification, and so on. So let's go back to how you do, you'd build an abstract syntax tree. So you'd get your code, you'd feed it to some parser, and these examples here we have Esprima, Acorn, all of these are actually written in JavaScript, but you could, you're not really, you don't really have to use a JavaScript-based parser. So all of these parsers, when you feed your code to it, they give you an AST. So what do we mean by an AST? So let's take a look at a very uh, short little program here. It says, hello world, and when we parse it, this is basically what we want our output to look like. It's a program consisting of an expression statement, which happens to be a call expression, and the call expression has an argument that's a literal, which is hello world. Now let's see what we meant by making modifications to it, alterations to it. So this is the output from Esprima, and as you can see, uh, it's, it says it's a body and so on, and this conforms to the uh, Mozilla SpiderMonkey parser API, and we could just, it's a JSON object, so we could just use JavaScript to traverse it and do uh, changes on it. But if you wanted to have a higher level API, you could use one of these tools, like Burrito, Falafel, and so on. Looking back at this, so let's say I wanna make a very small transformation here and change this value to something else. So I just go, write it to be its computer science. Next, I will use a uh, gener uh, code generating tool just like S-CodeGen, or maybe it's called ES-CodeGen. And after you do that, with, my tra with our transformed AST, this is what you get, it's computer science. So AST is not the only way you could do analysis on. You could have treated the code as text, as someone recently put a, a Chrome extension on GitHub, which would basically, you know, like whatever web page you're visiting, it would go and change all the instances of the word literally, to mean figuratively. So for something like that, you don't really need an AST. 
or you could parse your code progressively. So when you do pr uh, progressive parsing, what happens is like, instead of doing the, uh, parsing the entire source code at once, whole cell, you'd rather do it piecewise. And also it, it makes the uh, parser not really barf when there's an error. Like if you made an error, the parser should still give you some meaningful output. So that's what you get with progressive parsing. So after that, let's say, so we build an AST. Now, what is it that we'd probably want to do with it? So why do we even need a syntax tree? Why wouldn't we just use strings or regular expressions? Let's take a look, look at a simple example. Here we have this piece of code, and we want to find a variable named value in it. If we just use simple text search, we'll have this, like 15 places where it is. If we use abstract syntax tree, we can query for exactly a variable named value, and this is what we will get. We can do more generic searches. We can say find all strings, uh, sorry, all literals, or we can also find all strings, which can be helpful if we want, for example, to, do, to have consistent quotes. We can do this. Um, we can use regular expressions if we want to. So here we find all variables which starts with word extra. And we can also do more complex queries. Uh, here, for example, return, uh, we find return statement, statements in all functions which are named get value. It's not particularly helpful for this piece of code, but if we have a modularized application with many files with similar interfaces, this can be helpful. A tool exists which allows us to do this from command line. It's called GraspJS. So what Grasp does is it offers us a a little higher level, more structured query language. And for all the cases that Kirill just mentioned, let's see what they look like. So here, the first one is I'm capturing all uh, variable instances, second one literal, and so on. The last one here is the one Kirill just mentioned, so I'm trying to capture all the return statements of all functions whose name happens to be get ID. So it's cool to have a higher level query language like this. Uh, maybe it takes a little time to actually get used to them, but once you do, you'll find it much better. And once you have a, a query language and you find it, what is the next step you want to do? Like you find, like you use a map to find destinations because you actually want to spend vacations there, right? So you want to do something with it. So let's, let me give you a small example here. So here I have a small snippet of code, a function which is trying to just multiply two numbers. And for convenience, what we uh, did the, with the API is like, if you happen to pass only a single argument, it will uh, give you the square of the number. So can anyone spot what is uh, wrong with this potentially? Yeah, so if I were to pass zero as the second argument, I would get 25 instead of zero. So let's say I have a library where I have, uh, I might, I suspect I'm using these kinds of default assignment in a multiple places. So how would I use Grasp to find those? So here at the top, that's what the query language, would, uh, the query would look like. So I'm trying to gra uh, grab all instances where I have an expression that has a default value assignment like this. And if you run this, you find this exact instance we have. So once you find it, uh, the one thing I'd like to point out is like, uh, since it's based on an AST, the default argument here does not have to be simple, uh, simple literal. It could be any, any number of complex expression, like this one here. So once you find it, Grasp also lets you specify what the replacement for that, should, that would be. And here, I'm saying grab all these instances, and then I have the replacement where I'm saying if the argument happens to be undefined, then only do the assignment. So after you run this, it mechanically goes and changes all, refactors all your code where you have uh, the previous kind of assignments. So there are other tools which uh, do similar structural search and replace. Uh, some are available as command line tools, some are available as plugins for your favorite browsers. Or if it's not, then move to a, another browser. Another ID So now let's talk about code style. Why right? consistent code style is important? Well, first, code is much easier to read and maintain. It looks more professional. You don't have to fight with version control system or spaces. And then you can allow certain searching tricks. For example, if you're looking for assignment to, 
for the variable x, you can just say x equals something. And there is, if there are spaces there, you don't know if you'll, you'll be able to find what you need. So how, do, how can we enforce consistent code style? There is a concept of editor config. It's a configuration file and a set of plugins for multiple IDEs. And it solves common problems developers sell, face, like indentation, byte spacing, encoding. It's just a file. It goes in the root of your repository. And every developer which downloads it and has proper plugin installed for ID or code editor uh, will have proper settings. And big projects like jQuery and WordPress are using it. It doesn't have many settings, and it is language agnostic. But there is a tool which extends it. It's called Code Painter. It just adds a couple of JavaScript-specific properties. And great thing about it, it allows you to infer code style from your existing code. So if we take a look at this piece of code, we can see there is no spaces in brackets, and we use double quotes, and we have spaces around operators. And when we feed this code to Code Painter, it will actually infer the settings and will generate JSON for us. After this, we'll be able to use it on other code. And here we have this ugly function. It will make it beautiful. Uh, there are certain other tools, like JavaScript code style. It's extensible, but it doesn't know how to fix the results. There is a tool called JSBT5, which actually formats your code, but it's not extensible. And there is a new tool called ES Formatter. It has a lot of properties, but it only cares about white spaces. And now let's talk about linting. Uh, so by the way, if you're having trouble with uh, my accent or our accent, it's because we're from the East Coast, just not of the US. <laughs> so, uh, so one of the uh, uh, few static tools that we as a community have love to like, uh, we have taken it as an integral part of our build systems is uh, linters, and so let's define what linting is. So linting is the process of helping uh, you detect potential syntactical or sometimes even semantical errors with your code. And it also helps to ensure conformance to certain coding guidelines. So we know of JSLint, JSint, uh, Google's Closure Linter, we've all used it. I don't think you want, I want, you want me to bore you with all the details of these. So I'll rather focus on ESLint, which is a relatively a new kid on the block. And ESLint, what it does is, it's based on the Esprima parser, and it provides hooks so that you can write customized rules. So sometimes, you know, maybe in your project, you don't want your variables to be named certain ways. Uh, those kinds of rules you can't really express with any of the previous tools. So this one here allows you to provide customized rules. I'll give you an example. So here I'm trying to assign this object literal to both of these variables, but what happened was I only wrote half of the assignment operator here. So to fix, to find this, and it's not a good idea to do actually arithmetic on objects. So let's see how I would write a rule to capture that. So here, I'm saying this rule applies to all binary expressions. And on, the, on that particular node, if the operator happens to be one of these binary operators, I don't want either the left or the right to be an object expression. Otherwise, we'll report an error. So after we've set this rule, we would configure ESLint. This is the name of the module, the node module where we wrote the previous rule. And then you run this in voila. It tells you you're not supposed to do object arith arithmetic on objects. So, you know, like even my kid knows that when I have uh, like a flat tire on my car, he can tell me you got a flat tire, but he can't go and fix it. He wants me to go and fix it. So it would be really cool if I had a handyman following me all the time. I do, I break stuff, he goes and fixes it. So let's see if something can be done with uh, linting. Actually, a tool exists which does exactly that. It's called Fix My JS, and what it does, it fixes JS hint errors. So here, it can add semicolons. If you forgot debugger statement, it will just remove it. It won't break your build, and you'll have to go and change the code. And it also supports more than 20 properties of JS hint. And let's take a look, simple example. Here we have a code who was written by somebody who doesn't like JavaScript. And we have inconsistent quotes here. We don't have any brackets. And once we feed it, this is the result. One thing worth mentioning is replacing 
double equals for triple equals, it's probably not the safest thing in the world. And uh, FixMyJS takes your JS hint configuration, so you, you should be able to configure that as well. And we run it on underscore just to see if it will break it. So we tried to modify setting as much as possible, so it pretty much affected all the lines in underscore. And all tests were still passing for us, but still use it at your own discretion. And now let's talk about code metrics and how we can visualize them. So we talked about you know how code should look and so on, but that probably is not the only. Uh, being beautiful is probably not the only uh, qualitative uh, measure of code. So let's try to see if there are other measures we can derive out of our code automatically. Like uh, as engineers, you'd probably want to quantify anything and then see numbers rather than relying on your gut feeling. Like how, how is your project going? I feel it's going good. That doesn't cut, right? You have to have numbers to back it up. So these are a few of the metrics we can measure. And there's a, a library called ES Complex which handles, which deals, which gives us these things. So there's lines of code, average number of parameters per function, cyclomatic complexity, complexity density, and so on. Uh, let's take a look at a few of these. Uh, the easiest one would be lines of code. So in this example, we have seven physical lines of code, uh, but 11 logical lines. So you know, if you just put three um, empty lines, that doesn't count to logical lines. But these uh, return statements and uh, this if block do count as logical lines. Another one is cyclomatic complexity, which basically is a measure of how much branching there is in your code. And in this example, we have three if statements, one for loop, so there's four branches, so four is the cyclomatic complexity. So it's not like, you don't want to rely on a single measure, like is it, are you doing good? Well, we produce a thousand lines of code this day, so we're probably making a lot of progress. That would not be a good way to go about it. So you want to have multiple measures and take some sort of uh, weighted average out of those. So maintainability index is one such measure. I, I don't want to bore you with the actual mathematical function, but it's a logarithmic scale that goes from minus infinity to 171, and the higher you go, the better. And for that uh, example, we showed it was 108, which is not too bad. So recommended tools here are, you could use ES Complex the library, or you could use Complexity Report, which is a command line tool based on it, and then you have Plato. Now let's see what Plato does. So we ran this on Broccoli, and it shows you how your metrics have changed over time. So with total, average, um, total and average lines per file, it has actually gone down, which I believe is a better thing because that probably means they modularize their systems better. And the maintainability has not really gone up that much, but it wasn't really low to begin with. And it also lets you drill down by particular uh, uh, files. So here, if you notice that something is wrong, you would, you would go look at which files need some uh, TLC. And you could also sort them by various uh, metrics, linting errors, complexity, uh, source line of codes, and so on. And when you drill down into a single file, it also lets you look at which particular functions in that file are contributing to what kinds of uh, metrics. So now we've talked about you know, what good code should look like, what good co code should do. It uh, doesn't mean like, you know, it's good, you wanna, make, like, you wanna clone it and then put it everywhere. So let's see what happens with duplicated code. So having duplicated code is bad. It increases the size of your code base and it becomes really hard to maintain. There are two ways of getting duplicated code into your code base. It's either laziness when somebody uses copy and paste programming, or it's a coincident or just lack of team coordination. It's not really good to have duplicated code. It increases the size of your code base, and it's harder to maintain. As you probably know, it's not good to have duplicated code in your code base. <laughs> now let's talk about a tool which helps us to find duplicated code. It's called JavaScript copy paste detection. It only cares about code structure and behavior. So if you duplicated the code and you went and renamed a couple of variables, added a couple of spaces, it will still find it. And we decided to run it on jQuery. I know John is around and actually found a couple of duplicates. So here we have methods append and prepend and they share pretty much like 90% of the code. 
and only this, those highlighted lines in the middle are different. Uh, that's all about pure static analysis, and now we're getting to even more interesting part, combining static analysis and dynamic analysis together. So dynamic analysis is analyzing your code with running the program. And the first tool which combines them together is code coverage. Uh, so, you know, uh, we talked about quality, and uh, so one of the strongest measures of quality would be, does your thing actually work? So you gotta test it, but how do you know you've tested it enough? So one of the way to uh, test, what, one of the way to establish that would be to see how much of your source code that your tests cover. And the way to do it would be instrument your code, then run your tests, and then evaluate whether all of those checkpoints you had set in step one were actually encountered. Uh, there are tools like JS Coverage, Blanket JS, uh, Stanbull that do this. Now let's take a look at what Stanbull actually does with your code. So this is a piece of code before being instrumented. So I'm just adding ellipses to strings that are longer than uh, 30 character long. And after instrumentation, it would look something like this. So like before the function call, there is some sort of global, uh, global uh, map being set to keep all the analytics report. And then inside the function, every single line of my code has been wrapped with some more code that gathers some metadata and puts it in that global data. So after the instrumentation, I would run all of my tests, and then I could look at the report. For example, this is the report, and then as you can see here, uh, most of the things have good coverage, and I can see uh, one of my modules does not have enough coverage. So I could go into that and then make it better. So now let's go further with dynamic analysis. I'm going to talk about getting proper autocomplete and jumping to source because this is something like Java people are always happy about and which is, doesn't work in JavaScript that well. Oh, by the way, duplicated code is bad. It, it's like, it's uncontrollable. It spreads over all your code base. So there is a tool which calls cult. Uh, the way it works, it creates a static HTTP server, and every file it serves, it parses with Google Closure Parser, and it injects some special code. There is ID plugin which actually gets the information while running the script, and this is what helps us. Let's take a look how it works. Here we have a simple backbone code. So we have a model, and we're trying to get some autocomplete here. To understand this code, static analysis has to know about backbone internals and how it works and be extremely smart. Let's try IntelliJ. Here we have a nice list of properties, and what we need is not one there. We're looking for a variable hello. And it's actually on the second page, across with as those beautiful variables like dollar sign two and constructor, and that's definitely not what we need. There are 200 more properties if you scroll down. When you run the same code with cult, you get this here, as well as other properties which it in inherited from the object prototype. The same thing with jump to source. So here, when you click on this function, IntelliJ said, oh yeah, I actually I found like six instances. Where do they want to go? If you have a larger code base, it will be like 200 instances, and you will be lost. What cult does, it just jumps to source. I, I cannot even do screenshot for that. And uh, while preparing for the slide, I talked with cult developers, and I was not really happy because they didn't have this functionality in WebKit, so I would have, oh sorry, in IntelliJ. So I would have to add slides for Sublime plugin, and I asked them to review the slide and said, no worry, and I added this functionality today, so in the next, a uh, couple of days, uh, we'll be able to download WebKit plugin which supports that. And now let's talk about another tool. It's called SpyJS. It used to be a standalone web application, but actually IntelliJ acquired it recently, so now it's a part of uh, WebStorm. Uh, so SpyJS uh, is similar in to the previous tools we talked in certain ways. So what it does is we have a static uh, HTTP server through which you get your content, and uh, on the fly it will uh, insert 
you know, its own code, it will wrap all of your code with certain hooks so that it calls back to your ID with whatever is happening. And then you can, at the end, get an event log uh, on your ID. So, and on all of that code injection happens uh, via static analysis. So, uh, I think Daniel talked about Marinet the other day, and we we're saying, uh, let's try to uh, go and debug Marinet now. So, here on the left, I have my ID. On the right, I have loaded the uh, to-do MVC page. Next. So, it shows me all the events. So, there's a bunch of uh, scripts being loaded. And then after all the scripts have been loaded, I see an event like DOM content ready. And then after that event, it is loading uh, Google Analytics again. And now let's go and do something there. So I type in hello empire.js. And it again captures, like, so I have at 19 key strokes. Well, by the way, if you count the actual keys, uh, characters, it's not 19 because I had, like, backspaces and so on. So now uh, you have an event log. What you can do is you can actually select one of those events and see uh, the relevant stack trace of it. So here, uh, there's a bunch of jQuery uh, func methods there. And in there, you see the to-do MVC layout uh, module. So when you look at, when you select that one, you'd actually see the call stack of that particular uh, event. And the, the thing is, it's not actually just a call stack as you would get with like a Chrome debugger. It's more of it actually keeps the history of all the events that ever happened, so it's more like a tree. And you could go to any of those events that had happened in the past and see where it actually originated from. And then if you don't want to see all of this jQuery stuff, you would just select jQuery and say, okay, suppress any of the jQuery uh, modules from showing up in my call tree, like this. And it's clean there, and you select it, and it actually shows you the exact script responsible uh, attached with that event. And you can go do further stuff on your page, and it captures all of those events on, uh, on, your, uh, on your ID. And it, it's actually, since it's a, a simple proxy server, it catches events for not just one page, but any number of pages you have in your uh, uh, browser. So let's do a little recap of what we talked about. We discussed static analysis and how it helped us to learn things. We discussed dynamic analysis and how it can help to improve our workflow. There are a couple of things we didn't talk about which are actually interesting. We didn't talk about type analysis and inferring type. Uh, there is a way to use JSDoc to add kind of static type anal analysis in your ID. We didn't talk about more complex refactorings because a lot of refactorings cannot be done because you don't know if what will come into the function. It might be an object, it might be a number. So if you use dynamic analysis and if you run your code, you can make sure that it's always an object and then you can do the refactoring. We didn't, do about, we didn't talk about static security analysis. So all the things Jeremy talked about in his talk today, uh, most of them can be detected by JavaScript. Some tools exist which can do that, but most of the, them cost a lot of money. We didn't talk about using tests and generating tests. So it could be really cool to use tests to learn more information about the code. And also didn't discuss visualizing source code, building nice chart, flow charts, diagrams. As few tools exist, one interesting one, it builds a graph of, for common JS or for required JS modules. Uh, it's pretty raw, but it will be really interesting at some point. And that's it. My name is Kiel Cherkashin. This is Tsering Shirta. And we work at Lab 49. Thank you.